Hello, everyone. Um, for today's last session, can we please welcome Mr. Hello, everybody. I want to talk to you about some stuff that I started after I read a paper by Luis Enrique from Intel. He published in the OSPERT workshop in June in Ireland. And what he did was he was taking the RT preempt patch and evaluating it from the point of view of what difference does it make to have a threaded interrupt handler instead of a, a, a traditional interrupt handler. And what he found was the RT preempt patch gave sucky performance and sucky latency. I couldn't believe that. So I wanted to reproduce his results and then to try and find out why. And this is the story of what we did. I've got to start with a very, very brief history of computing. Back in the 1950s, 19, you know, early 40s and 50s, before people really understood about computing very much, there weren't any interrupts. When a computer wanted to do some I.O., it would go out and ask the device for some. And it would just sit there until it was ready. And things were cool, providing, because you didn't do that much I.O., you're mostly computing, and things were really slow anyway. So it didn't matter much. But people wanted to do things two at a time. They, they suddenly realized that they got these multi-million dollar machines, which were sitting around doing nothing except for waiting for a slow serial port to come back at 110 board and say, oh, my character's ready. So they decided to invent this thing called interrupts, which is when the device wants some attention, it tells the processor, hey, look at me. Come and talk to me. So, these things allow the I.O. to happen in parallel with comp computation. But, they steal time. The interrupt handler steals time for whatever's going on as your main task, the main job you're trying to do. So while your web, web server's running and busily serving requests, when an interrupt comes, the interrupt service routine steals time from the web server and makes it a little bit slower. You, which may or may not be bad. Normally, you've got enough time in your machine to do everything you need to do. But sometimes, things get bad. What I want you to do is imagine that I'm a clerk in a health insurance office or something. My job is to move papers from this inbox to that outbox and calculate the claim in the meantime. The question is, how do the papers get into that inbox in the first place? Well, it's simple. Someone brings me on the phone, and, they, and I grab an empty form and fill it in. All right? So here I am. I grab my form, start filling it in. Oops, bing, bing, bing. <coughs> Hello? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll set that. And there's another one to go in the inbox. So I slide it under the tray. Oh, there's another interrupt. Bing, 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 bing. Hello? Right, 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 right. Another interrupt. And so it goes on and goes on and goes on. And eventually, have you noticed in all that time, I haven't actually processed anything from the pile into the out tray. All I've done is fill up new forms and add them into the in tray. This is a problem. Traditionally, interrupt handling is a, runs at a higher priority than anything else in the system, including real-time tasks. What that means is that while an interrupt routine is running, nothing else is uh, on a particular core. I mean, if you've got multiple cores, then you can do things on the other cores. I'm not, I'm not worried about that at the moment. So also, interrupts are prioritized. So you can have multiple interrupt sources in the system, and depending on which architecture you're, you're running on, a higher priority interrupt can interrupt the processing of a lower priority interrupt. Typically, on systems that allow this, you limit the depth so you don't run out of kernel stack. Also, there's a thing called a soft IRQ. Under Linux, this, this is like an interrupt handler, but it runs at a lower priority than any hardware interrupt. In order to try and reduce latency, for lower priority interrupts, typically what an interrupt handler will do inside a device driver is it will do anything that it's got to do urgently and it will defer work to some other time, typically by raising a soft interrupt. It could also do it by starting a kernel thread or by scheduling a tasklet, or there's a plethora of me mechanisms within the Linux kernel. But for the one we're going to be looking at, which is the E1000 driver, it starts a soft IRQ. So, an alternative is to use a threaded interrupt. These, these, are, these have been used for ages in other operating systems, in Solaris, in, since SunOS 2, uh, in FreeBSD since the time they got SMP, 
Um, microkernels always do it. Uh, so it's, it's not a new phenomenon. In fact, uh, Holt in the Tunis operating system, this was the only mechanism back in the uh, early 90s. What you do here is instead of stealing time from the current running process and stealing the kernel stack from the current running process when you're running your interrupt routine, you have a completely separate, sh separately schedule kernel thread. And what it does is it just goes around doing its stuff until it comes to the point where it hasn't got any more work to do, and then it goes to sleep and waits for an interrupt. When the interrupt happens, it services the interrupt to say, OK, stop interrupting me, and then carries on running in the thread. This is nice because threads are preemptible. Other work can happen. Secondly, they're prioritizable. So you're not reliant on the hardware priority of the, thread ha of the interrupt handler. You can now prioritize, the, prioritize these against any other activity in the system. That's pretty neat. Linux has had this capability since 2631 about. I can't remember the exact detail, but I'm sure John could tell me off the top of his head. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, that's right. And RT preempt always does it, but we'll come to that later. So, threads can be prioritized against other threads and against real-time work, and this is where it becomes interesting. And they can also be prioritized against everything else. What's more, because threads can sleep, a lot of the need for having a special thread routine and deferring work to something else is no longer there. So you don't need to defer work anymore. You can put it all in the standard thread if you want to. There, are, there might still be some reasons for, for doing it in special cases. Um, what's more, a thread that can sleep is much easier to program than an interrupt handler where you've got special rules you've got to follow. OK. Linux can use threaded interrupts now. The E1000 doesn't. It uses the traditional method um, and then defers almost all the work it does to a soft IRQ. It only re-enables re the interrupt on the card after the soft IRQ has processed all the packets that are currently outstanding. To process the packets, it's got to uh, add the SK buff header and push it up the, up the uh, TCP IP stack and wake up anything in user space that's, that's waiting for it. That, that's, that's the work it's got to do. There may be one or two others that I can't remember. I can't remember. So the RT preempt patch, the idea of RT preempt is to try to make the kernel completely preemptible everywhere and so to reduce latencies as much as possible for real-time tasks. It forces the use of threads in the interrupt routines. So every, thread, every interrupt will be done by a thread. This allows, as before, um, interrupts to be prioritized against real-time tasks, and so you can have some real-time tasks that are higher priority than most interrupts. Um, there's a whole page on the audio wiki out there to say how to prioritize your various tasks so as to get low latency audio against your interrupts from the, the network and goodness knows what else. So we decided to measure this. We started off with a test bed, a very simple one. We started off with a uh, Procurve gigabit unmanaged switch. We chose that one because it's got really low latency um, switching. We've got a number of load generators. These things ran a program called IPBench, which is available on SourceForge. What IPBench does is it lets you set up load generation benchmarks for multiple load generators at a time. And as part of that suite of tests, it has a latency and throughput test, where it generates packets in a variety of protocols. We use the UDP protocol, and times how long each packet takes to get to the target and back again and then it, it lets you aggregate all those and report on them. On the target, we ran the IPBench target test, which just does a little bit of uh, CPU usage monitoring in the configuration we used. We ran cyclic test, which I'm going to come to in a minute, and we ran UDP echo, which is just INETD. So the idea is, these things here generated a whole heap of load, UDP packets going out there at a controlled rate, comes to here, and gets echoed back, and they get timed and measured to find out how much throughput the device under test did. These boxes, by the way, were 2 gigahertz Celerons with uh, 512K cache uh, and uh, E1000 Ethernet ports. So they're, they're not particularly modern or, or high-end machines, but it's adequate for this. Cyclic test is a real-time latency test program. It runs in real-time mode, 
in, 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 at a high priority. We set it up to have a higher priority than anything else on the system. And what it does is it goes to sleep and for a particular time. So it schedules a wake-up sometime in the future. When it wakes up, it measures the time between when it should have woken up and the time it actually woke up and reports that. And it reports the maximum, the minimum, and the average. From a real-time perspective, all I'm interested in is the maximum latency. And that's all I'm going to talk about today. So on a, on a good system, you should be able to wake up within a few microseconds. I mean, these are two gigahertz machines. And it's lots of cycles. If there's other things going on that aren't preemptible, then it's going to wake up a lot later. So what kind of throughputs do we get? Well, look at this. Your standard throughput graph looks like this. It's got a flat portion here where there's no queuing happening in the system. So your low, your, your throughput is dependent on your load. You've got more load, you'll get more throughput. And then it should have a flat portion. At this point, you're bottlenecked by some resource in the system. And your throughput depends not on your applied load, because it's flat. It depends on how fast you can actually process the requests. What we see in these graphs is a massive droop as soon as you hit straight after the peak. By Gunther's performance law, that says there's contention in the system. The x-axis here is in kilopackets per second. The interesting part's up the end here from about 100 packets per second each. That's uh, 10 microseconds between packets on average. And we ran it down to 5 microseconds between packets on average. RT preempt conked out at about 6 microseconds per packet. It suddenly stopped echoing anything. Um, when we ran it with cyclic test, the results are even smaller because cyclic test is also sealing some of the CPU, which is one of the bottleneck resources. So what's happening here is that something is stealing time, and I think it's interrupts. Let's look at the latencies. Under standard Linux, the latencies reach about 1.6 milliseconds at the 5, millise 5 microsecond interpacket arrival rate. RT preempts pretty good. It's less than, 100, uh, less than about 180 in that case. But I've left off the last two curves because otherwise they'd be off scale. Um, RT preempt at the 5 microse microsecond interpacket arrival time had a 50 millisecond latency. And this is in a system that shouldn't have any long latency non preemptive points. What is going on here? We've come now to the end of the results that Louis Henrik presented at Osbert. Everything else from now on is new. We used Ftrace to find out what was going on. This is at the 10 microsecond interval rate. For standard Linux, the interrupt happens, and after about 5 microseconds, while the hard IRQ handler is running, it raises a soft IRQ and that runs. And it runs for about 70 microseconds, that's enough time for 10 more packets to arrive. Uh, sorry, 7 more packets to arrive. And then UDP echo gets about 25 microseconds of time before the interrupt fires again and we start again. Right? So in that time, 100 microseconds, we've got 10 packets arriving. And it turns out the UDP echo in 25 microseconds can only handle about three. And that explains why the performance is so poor. The RT preempt case, we have about 200 microseconds between interrupts. So it's a longer period. It takes about 20 microseconds doing something or other before the hard IRQ thread is scheduled. So it's slower. And this is probably just poor implementation somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't actually looked at what that code really does. I just thought, Bleh. We then have 15 microseconds in the um, hard IRQ thread. And then the soft IRQ thread runs. And it runs for 155 microseconds. That's about twice the time it ran here for about twice the period, twice the number of packets. So that's reasonable. And that's the only bit that I find reasonable. But poor UDP echo only gets 10 microseconds to do some echoing. So instead of echoing about three packets, it echoes about one. The other thing we found interesting here is that if 
we managed to catch cyclic test waking up during this period, during the soft IRQ thread. When the, after the timer handler ran, instead of the cyclic test starting to run, it was deferred until the end of soft IRQ net RX, even though it had a higher priority. Turns out that the timer thread, sorry, the timer interrupt doesn't invoke schedule when it returns. And there are probably good reasons for that, and I didn't want to change them. So that's why we were getting those really long latencies. So where do we go from here? Obviously, UDP echo is not getting enough time. And soft IRQ is taking too long. Well, we decided to try and fix the latency first, sorry, the, the, the throughput first, and we'll have a look at cycling test latency a bit later on. What we're going to do is we're going to try making echo a real-time task. And we'll give it the same priority as the soft IRQ. This means that when the soft IRQ runs, it's in the FIFO class, so it will run to completion, then UDP echo should run to completion before soft IRQ can run again. Sound reasonable? Well, this is the throughput. Um, this time, this is RT preempt with those changes, these, these green lines. And standard Linux, which used to have the higher throughput, is the red lines. That looks really nice. We've more than doubled our throughput. You know, it, it used to be 20 kilopackets per second at the, 100, at the 10 microsecond interval viable rate. Now we're getting about 55, 56. Um, we're still getting a droop here. And uh, that, that's a bit disturbing. Under this circumstance, again, when the hard IQ runs here, it has preempted UDP echo. So UDP echo runs first and takes 305 microseconds. And when it finishes handling all the packets it's got, the soft IQ runs for 200 microseconds. And then, because the soft IRQ starts scheduling more packets for UDP echo to handle, UDP echo starts running again for 10 microseconds before the interrupt hits again. Remember, we've got a 10 microsecond inter interpacket arrival time. And so that explains why we're getting too much. But this is still taking too much time relative to UDP echo. We're, we're actually still putting too many packets in there that just get queued and never actually get processed. If you're going to drop packets, it's much better to drop them in the card before you do any work on them. So let's see what we can do next. So what I'm going to try and do this time is we're going to restrict artificially the amount of t work you can do in soft IRQ and then have an explicit preemption point. We chose 32 packets, but you could choose 16 or 64. We, we ran it at 64 as well. Uh, with very little difference in throughput, but there was another difference which I'll come to later. We'll add explicit projections, and this is what we get this time. Ooh, this looks really nice. Now, we're getting close to 60 kilopackets per second, regardless of the packet arrival rate. Now, that's really nice. So, now that we've solved our throughput problem, let's look at cyclic test latency. We have 50 milliseconds of latency. That is absolutely appalling. Why? Well, it turns out that the designers of the Linux scheduler decided to stop people from shooting themselves in the foot. They've introduced this thing called run balancing. What run balancing does is it looks over the last 900, 90, 950 milliseconds in each second and says, have we run any timeshare processes in that time? If we haven't, pick one and run it. If we haven't got a timeshare process to run, run the idle thread. What this is for is because if you're running a real-time process that actually runs continuously and hogs all the CPU time, you can't get into the shell to kill it. So it allows administrators to get in and kill a runaway real-time process. And if you actually design your real-time processes correctly, they shouldn't be taking up 100% of the CPU time anyway. So we need to find a way to solve the throughput problem and the latency problem that does not involve running the entire system at real-time priority. OK.
I'm going to suggest some heresy. Why don't we run the interrupt thread as a timeshare process, as a timeshare thread? Well, why not? Then we can use NICE to get a good balance between the interrupt thread and UDP echo. The way that NICE works at the moment in the scheduler, this might change next week, who knows, is that the scheduler looks at the beginning of each period at all of the runnable threads, and it decides on a period to run them for. Then it adjusts the amount of time that each one has within that period so that an increase of one in NICE means 10% less CPU time. Now, we measured the relative time taken for UDP echo and for the soft IRQ for very slow packets arriving. And it turns out that UDP echo in user space needs about one and a half times the time that the soft IRQ does. One and a half is about 1.6 to 1, which is NICE 5. So that's nice. So we started off with a standard 26314 kernel. And we changed the E1000 driver, firstly, to request a threaded interrupt. Next, we ran that threaded interrupt handler at shed normal. And thirdly, we got rid of the soft IRQ, and we folded all of the deferred work into the main interrupt thread. We capped, sorry, we niced that thread down to nice five, whatever. And we did at most 32, batches, 32 packets before calling preempt. Okay. This means that cycle test is now the only real-time task, and theoretically, it should get good latencies. Let's see what we got. Ooh! 100 kilo packets per second. Now, that is really neat. And in the unoverloaded un un system, the curve tracks the original curves exactly. That's really nuts. In this case, it's with, um, with cyclic tests, so the, the, the uh, peak is about 80 kilopackets per second. That's because cyclic test is taking some of the CPU time. This one's just an idle, otherwise idle system. Let's have a closer look at that. This line, it's kind of noisy, but it's approximately flat, which is exactly what we expect to to have in the theoretical case, which I showed you before. So we must be doing something right. And this is the, is the cyclic test latency graphs. Here, standard Linux is the bright green bar, and as before, it goes up to about 1.6 milliseconds. I've left off those really bad RT preempt results, because otherwise the graph will be too small and you won't be able to see it. And the standard Linux latency is around about oh, 600 microseconds, which is more than RT preempt. But then we haven't done all the work that RT preempt did to try and find all those long latency things and add um, preemption points. It turns out that that 600 microsecond latency is still mostly soft IRQ. And if you reduce the, the, the number of packets per batch to 16, it goes down a bit. If you increase it to 64, it goes up a bit. I couldn't get it to go to zero, uh, to, to, to reduce down to the same as RT preempts without doing a lot more work than I had time for for this so far. So this, this, this is beginning to look as if this is the way to go. And it is sort of what I expected because of the way that it worked when we did, were doing the user driver stuff that I reported on, I can't remember, eight years ago at LCA. In the user level drivers stuff, in order to get good network performance, we had to move the, we had to run the um, interrupt stuff in the same thread as the stuff that consumed the results of that interrupt. Because what we've got here essentially is a producer-consumer problem. The network card is accepting packets from the network and then pushing them upstream. And the rate that that's controlled at is purely determined by the rate at which they're coming in from the network. The poor old consumer, UDP Echo in this case, can only handle so much, but there's no feedback from it to the stuff in the kernel to say, hey, stop sending me anything, slow down. And an ideal solution would have some kind of end-to-end -end flow control. But for now, this is what we've got. So where do we go from here? Well, what we have at the moment is a 10-line patch that is incredibly hacky. It's got, you know, 
it's got the um, interrupt line that happened to be um, scheduled by the BIOS, hard-coded in there, and stuff like that. It was only there in order to test this, this system. We've also hand-tuned the nice value that we used. So if, we want to get, if I want to get something like this into the kernel, which I would like to eventually to just improve the performance massively, we're obviously going to have to do a lot of work to clean this stuff up. First thing to do is to automatically work out some way of prioritizing the time given to the soft IQ thread, the, the, the packet input thread, versus the stuff that's doing the real work. That, I think, is going to be a hard problem. One way to do it might be to monitor the size of the queues at the socket and uh, essentially increase effective interrupt hold-off at the card depending on how long the queue is. So if there's lots of stuff queued up, then just ignore packets for a while. The card will either generate pause frames and slow down the source, or it'll just drop them there. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you're running UDP, then you expect to lose packets anyway. If you're running, uh, I'll take the questions later. If, if you're running TCP, then the, the, the protocol in itself has got back off and all sorts of things to try and uh, quench the source of it. Secondly, we've obviously got to test with other loads. UDP Echo is a really nice load in that it's very easy to theorize about. And it's really easy to see what's going on. Real workloads are much more complicated. If you're running HTTP over TCP, then TCP layer does all sorts of stuff to quench sources and to uh, control windows that makes it a lot harder to reason about. But we've obviously got to test there to make sure this stuff still works in that case. Um, likewise, it'd be nice to, to try stuff where there's significant activity on the transmit side as well as on the receive side. Uh, NFS, for example, where a single small request can generate blocks of data coming back or blocks of data going if it's only a few bytes coming back. So stuff like that needs to be done too. I want to test other drivers. Um, E1000, maybe what we've got is a special case for E1000. I don't know. I think it's general, but it would also be nice to get a really high-performance SSD and try the interrupt handling there and see, see what that does. And there's a few remaining latencies there. Um, I still think that 600 microseconds is too long. So find out where those latencies are. There's good tools in the kernel for doing that now. And uh, try and stomp them. But latency stomping is a kind of well -macker, mole, mole whacker, not well whacker, um, effect. You, you find one and another one pops up. And you're never sure that you've exercised all the parts in the kernel that might have latency. So, and finally, clean up the patches and submit. So that's where I want to go. This is where I am now. And that lights up my talk, so have we got any questions? Um, we have one there first. Do you still want to ask a question? Uh, uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a microphone coming. Yeah. There's a lot of people up the front, so bring the mics up the front. Unless you've got one at the back there. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've just got a quick question about that graph. Um, the one on the right. Yep. Uh, what does it mean to have the um, throughput higher than the... Oh, there's a bit on the left where the throughput seems to be higher than the load. Um, throughput on the left? Oh, sorry. That's the CPU usage. Oh, and that right. there is the throughput. Oh, I see. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah? Good evening. Um, in 2006, Van Jacobson gave a talk at LCA about um, basically taking the network driver for 10 gig Ethernet cards and taking it out of the kernel and moving to Yay, user space, good idea. Sp space um, which I think is you're probably you know, tracking that work, uh, or I imagine you've already seen this basic process. Yeah, uh, and I it's guess effectively what we did for the user mode interrupts uh, three years earlier. Yeah, yeah. The, um, and I guess my observation here is that you know, the, the thought that came out of uh, Van's talk was that this was for uh, situations where you didn't need something like IP tables or any yep. uh, you know, logic you know, there. It was just all going to be handled by one application. And this is obviously in the kernel. Um, do you see any, any of those problems that were going to affect Van's uh, 
work affecting this? Yes, there could be some. I mean, I consider IP tables to be uh, a, a big lump of spaghetti that I don't want to touch with a barge pole. Uh, it's kind of one unit, and just enabling in your kernel drops your Ethernet performance by 5% or something. I, I haven't measured exactly, but I, I've noticed it. Um, so these things are without IP tables. Um, so I really think that for the firewall case, you're probably going to do something different anyway, because with a firewall, you're not so much concerned about more performance, you're concerned about safety, and there are other concerns involved. Um, that being said, if anybody wants to rewrite IP tables to be cleaner and neater and easier to understand and faster, then go ahead. Yep. Uh, do you say you still had the scheduler interrupts running? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, do you still have the scheduler timer interrupts running? Uh, it's a constant period. Um, no, we were running with the tick list kernel. John. Okay, if I understand your results correctly, what's going on here is that you're deprioritizing the interrupt handler to the point that, that it's not processing all the incoming packets and it's dropping them and you're, you're shedding the system load as a result. Yes. So I guess my sense from this is, first of all, this is what NAPI was intended to do. Yep. And um, were you running this card in NAPI mode? We tried and it both in NAPI code and non-NAPI code, m mode rather, and it didn't seem to make much difference. Yeah. Well, but part of the, the stated advantage of NAPI was that it would drop packets in the card when, the, when they couldn't be handled in the thing. But, but in any case, my question is, isn't that really where you should be addressing this effort, is explicitly leaving packets on the card if you've got this kind of a scenario where they're coming in, as opposed to messing with priorities and, and doing that sort of stuff? Yep, that, that could be possible. Um, and... Uh, we, we should obviously explore that. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I, th I think your points are really good. In fact, um, I think part of the problem here is really the fact that you're using UDP. If you try the same test with, uh, with a different product, or say TCP or anything with the congestion control, you're going to see a, a much different result. And the reason is that the UDP protocol itself has no congestion control. So nope. it's going to push as fast as it can, regardless of... Uh, uh, of what the actual link can handle. I mean, you, we see exactly the same thing with virtualization, for instance. If you have a guest transmitting UDP to the, to the outside world, and because the link between the guest and the host is so much faster than your actual physical Ethernet, what's going to happen is it's going to transfer, transfer as fast as it can and simply drop off most of the packets uh, before it gets out. Yep. So I think a lot of the problems here is actually coming from the, uh, the protocol. And the solution is, is good, but unfortunately there's a one big limitation is that with received traffic uh, a priori, you don't know who the traffic is for, no. right? So the problem is that if you deprioritize the interrupt, and it works as long as you only have one consumer. As soon as you have two consumers, uh, you're in trouble because uh, if, if you deprioritize it for one consumer, then the other consumer will end up being, uh, being uh, uh, penalized, where, um, even though it's not doing the wrong thing. Um, um, so I think part of the problem here is really an overall network design issue. Um, people who actually <laughs> design networks shouldn't be using UDP in situations where UDP wasn't uh, meant to, to be used. For, I mean, that's, uh, that's a big problem. So, so yeah, I think, I think uh, we, we need to consider the product aspect of this as well as the oh, scheduling yeah. side. Oh, yeah. Um, I was using UDP mostly so that I had a controllable interrupt rate at the far end. And because uh, I, I started off being mostly interested in what's the effect on real-time latency of interrupt load. Uh, and this, this throughput stuff was a bit of a surprise. And that's when we started to investigate it and see what was going on. And there are situations when you do get hit with heavy UDP loads, particularly in DOS attacks. And you need to be able to handle that case. No, it's not. You've got to drop the packets as soon as you can, preferably in the car before you see them. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. On, on part of the usual set of tweaks you do for a server to deal with a high packets per second rate, would be uh, NAPI, obviously, which ends up somewhat like the threaded polling yes. card, and uh, soft RSS and those sorts of things to try yes. and spread your soft IQ handling across multiple cores. The one um, thing you can do, though, is um, if you've only got one core, is do the capping. That was the thing that led to the most yes. advantage. If, you, if you've got... Because the soft IQ at the moment tries to handle all the packets that are queued, and because more are arriving while it's going there, it has unbounded latency there. 
And so just doing 64 and then dealing with whatever comes later on allows you to handle bursts and still meet your real-time well, commitments. I, in my testing, I've found that if you spread the hardware, the nappy handling around across multiple cores, you end up thrashing locks and things and yes. you get lower performance. Uh, but the soft IOQs can be spread out reasonably well on multiple cores without... You end up with more than one core worth of performance. Yeah. Um, now, if you start tying the hardware interrupt handling and the soft IQ together by putting them in the one thread, you can no longer split them across multiple cores and have Well, you can. Multiple, I mean, you can run multiple threads, obviously. You, you can. Um, you just direct... Dep depending on your APIC layout, you can get APICs that will round robin them between multiple things. Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. ones I'm talking about only have one hardware receive queue. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we are talking about obsolete hardware, right? Yeah, this, this does... Yeah. My question is, I haven't, I haven't even thought about that, so I don't know. Which packet do you drop the uh, uh, first one in or last one in? It's obviously the last one's in, because what happens is the, the card, is the card doing the dropping if there's going to be any dropping happening. And so its buffers fill up. It generates the interrupt, but the interrupt's ignored because we haven't enabled it yet. And any more ones will just generate pause frames going back to say, hey, don't send me anything more. I suspect from the application point of view, uh, dropping the, the uh, oldest packet you have uh, will lead to the best throughput. It m wouldn't, actually, because you've already received the, f the oldest packet. You've already done some work on it. If you drop it, you're wasting some of your CPU time. Oh, no, you don't, you don't drop anything that's already in your queue. You drop them in the car before they get to the queue. Okay? I mean, if, if you've done any work on it at all, it's too late. No any more questions? questions? Okay. Okay. On behalf of LCA, thank oh, you. Thank you. you. And I'll be at the professional networking session tonight if anybody wants to ask me more stuff. <laughs>